But this yes. chart shows you the data of the study. So yes. what we found was all except for one of the people tested uh, yes. who have an autism diagnosis, that brings it to 97.4% of the autistic population had a perfect pitch. Mind-blowing. I mean, yes. <laughs> yes. Mind-blowing. We all see it, but we don't know how to bring it out. How can we prove it? How can we test it? So everyone who works with an autistic kid says, oh, they're so musical. They can play yeah. everything. But why isn't anyone calling it at what it really is? Yes. Okay. Yes. So we need to test these kids because we need to make them aware of their gift, but we need to be aware of their gift so that we can begin teaching differently. Exactly. And um, can this perfect pitch be actually a um, uh, trouble? When you're trying to teach the child or the students how to read music notation? It can be a disaster if the teacher doesn't know about this method. <laughs> yes, that's why. I mean, if they know exactly where the notes are and they can hear them, then why is this a problem? Because part of the gift is that there are all of these awarenesses and abilities on one side of the brain. and which means that you have to think of like a fuse outage because it's sucking all the electricity in this one big powerhouse on one side. So there's a supercomputer here that's able to produce on a very high level. There are other areas of the brain that aren't being tapped into. And our method is specifically designed to create pathways so that both sides of the brain are being tapped into evenly. And once we have this balance, the areas that are strengthened are the areas that present as weaknesses initially. So if the teacher is not aware that there is any perfect pitch and they start t trying to teach in the traditional way, the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to take the weaknesses and the weaknesses will just become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And suddenly you have a student who seems to be musically gifted and is unable to learn. Yes, yes, I experienced experience that myself with uh, some of my students. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about. We get, yes. we get students who um, are adult students who will say, I was always told that I was lazy, I didn't practice enough, that I was too stupid to learn, but I was able to listen to the radio and play anything. Yes, I mean, this doesn't make sense. There, there, there's some gap, something, yes. Yes, exactly. So that's exactly what we keep seeing. What I found interesting in something you just said is that um, if you uh, teach properly uh, using the proper method, you will have um, like neurons between the left side and the right side of the brain. I was wondering, does this really affect other areas uh, other than music, like maybe reading or speech, or does it have an effect? Absolutely. So obviously, um, this method goes a lot deeper than just, hey, let's teach note reading to people who have a gift. It's all evidence-based because of the neurology of what happens with perfect pitch. And what we found with perfect pitchers is almost across the board, especially for the right brain variation, we have people who have professed difficulty with reading comprehension and difficulty in mathematics. And that, again, goes against the stereotype of, hey, people who study music or are good in music or good in math, and wait, but I'm terrible in math, or I'm terrible in school, or they said I was dyslexic, or I was in special ed because I was a failure, I always failed in school, but I'm so smart, what's wrong with me? What we found was that with a perfect pitch, there is a difficulty or a divide between, or what we call visual motor cohesion. So it's either you are playing or you're looking at the book. They're not able to do both. And the first thing you'll notice is you have this book open and you're, you're sitting there and you're pointing and the kid is, um, I'm on page seven, song called The Swing, okay? And the kid is taking a peek and looking up and down. So yeah. that's your, word, your first warning sign. Yes, I have it all the time. Yes. Look at the eyes. If the eyes yeah. go up and down, you know there's perfect pitch. Okay. okay. That's 
people tell me, what, the eyes, perfect pitch? Yes, because the finger is the vocalizer of the sound that they already have in their head. Okay. And when they look at the note, or they look at the, because it, because it starts with pitch, our system mm -hmm. first begins with pitch. So if it first starts with pitch, the first thing they're exposed to is, this is a pitch, this is a different pitch, and this is a different pitch. C, D, E. When I look yeah. at it, I hear it in my head. Now, uh -huh. my fingers want to extract the sound and reproduce it on the instrument. However, I don't have the integration yet. And the first thing that you're going to see is most perfect pitchers will come in doing this. We call this the hunt and pack. Okay. Yes, yes. So when yeah. you're forcing them to not do this and you're forcing them to use a C finger, a D finger, E finger, F finger, G finger, they're completely yeah. lost in the geography. So they have no connection to these fingers and they don't know how to get the sound out from the head through this new fingering. And that's why they're looking up at the note, down at the finger to guide their hand in this new crazy place that you've put them by force. But now I understand. So this is what builds the neurons. So this actually well what builds what builds the connection is the parent or the caregiver or the teacher who's sitting on the right hand side is constantly being asked to point. Why? Because the kid is looking up and down and every time they look back up, you don't want them to deplete by having to use their eyes to track and find their place yeah. in the book. You want yes. their eyes to know exactly where to look for the next note because the pencil is already there. Okay. And the more you point week after week after week, you're going to see a decrease in the up-down. And by yeah. week six, and I've done this for five years, I can tell you by week six, they, their eyes are 100% in the book. Okay. And when it's 100% in the book, that's when you know it's time to bring in book two with two hand playing. But you cannot bring in two hand playing before the visual motor cohesion has occurred. Okay. So no, this, this method is completely uh, based on neuroplasticity. So what we do is we activate the cognitive hemisphere of the brain by this highly stimulating task where they're getting to create sound as fast as humanly possible from a written, from a visual stimulus. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we're building visual motor cohesion because they're creating the sound from, so the motor cortex is activated at the same time as the cognitive regions. As this pathway is being built, it just so happens to be that it's passing through the speech center. Mm -hmm. So by the time we have week six, when we're putting the two hands together, that's when my parents of the nonverbal students are going to report, and I'm actually able to observe this in the lesson, when they're playing, they're keeping the eyes in the book. They're vocalizing the letters that they are playing. C, D, E, C, D, E, D, E, F, E, hold, hold. So the nonverbal kids are starting to vocalize, at least read or sing what they're playing. Um, if they are uh, using RPM to spell and communicate and learn academics, they are um, pointing to whatever they're spelling to, but also speaking or announcing the letters they're pointing to. And there's just this, this explosion of language that it happens to become a byproduct of the visual motor cohesion. It's amazing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah.